second uh, Greensby consultation meeting uh, to consider the merger of West Kirby and Upton at Greensby. I'm Peter Rushton from Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, I'm here to chair the meeting tonight. Uh, also with us tonight is the Chief Fire Officer, Dan Stevens, and a number of the senior managers from the fire service. Uh, on screen uh, is the agenda for the evening, which includes an explanation uh, of the consultation process and then some of the headlines of the Chief's presentation. Uh, this will be followed by an opportunity for yourselves to make comments and ask questions. Uh, the Chief's presentation uh, is going to cover statutory duties of the Fire and Rescue Authority, the financial challenges we face, budget decisions, the merger options that we've considered, and the proposals uh, on the Greasby Fire Station. Just to make it clear, this is not a planning consultation, but a consultation about changes in fire cover, and whether in the circumstances our proposals are reasonable. It's the fourth public meeting we've held, and obviously the second in Greasby. Uh, the others in West Kirby and Upton. And we're also holding deliberative forums and a stakeholder forum. As I should say, the Chief is now going to give you a presentation of our proposal, and then it will be over to you to ask questions. We're going to ask you to come up to the mic to ask those questions uh, so that everybody in the building uh, can, can hear you uh, and, and take part. <coughs> there are two other rooms outside there uh, full of people who are also listening and seeing the same as you. Um, uh, at, at the end of it, uh, you've got a, you, hopefully you, as many as possible have got a newsletter and there are survey forms, if you haven't picked them up, there are some on the tables at the back and we'd like you to fill them in if you can. Um, we intend to finish at 9 o'clock tonight. Thanks very much. Dan? <coughs> Thanks, Peter. Vicky, can you move the slides on, please? Okay, I don't control the, uh, the presentation for a so I'm going to have to ask one of my colleagues to uh, move the slides on after, uh, after I've spoken to each one. Uh, before we start, and at the risk of uh, insulting anyone's intelligence here, and that, that certainly is not my intention, I need to make it clear from the outset that Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority is a standalone statutory body convened under Section 103, uh, sorry, Part 1 of the Fire and Rescue Services Act. We are not Will Metropolitan Brother Council. And as the Chief Fire Officer, I, in the same way as the Chief Constable, is responsible for operational policing matters. I am responsible for operational fire and rescue cover for the county of Merseyside. We need to make that clear from the, uh, from the outset. And that is very much the context in which that I speak to you tonight and I will make clear what my position is in relation to the matter of the proposed merger. The Fire and Rescue Services Act 2004 Part two details the core functions of the Fire and Rescue Authority. These are the specific operational response functions. Section six is not up on the board. That is, that is related, uh, that relates to the duty to provide fire safety advice. That is not impacted at all by the current financial challenge faced by the authority in this sense or indeed this proposal. Section seven of the act is our duty to respond to fires. Section eight is the duty to respond to road traffic collisions. Section nine is the duty to respond to emergencies as defined in the Fire and Rescue Services Emergencies England Order 2007, Articles 1 through 3, which is specifically for chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear and conventional explosive emergencies all emergencies which require the rescues of persons from collapsed structures or serious transport incidents which do not involve motor cars, i.e. trains, trams or aircraft. 
Section 11 of the Fire and Rescue Services Act details the elective powers available to the Fire and Rescue Authority. Those powers extend to us making a response to any incident where somebody may die, be injured or become ill. The same extends to animals or the environment. That is pretty much anything that isn't covered in sections 7 through 9. Can you move the slide on please, Mickey? The Fire and Rescue Service National Framework is required under Section 21 of the Fire and Rescue Services Act and that places a duty on the Secretary of State for the Department for Communities and Local Government, which is Eric Pickles, to prepare a Fire and Rescue Service National Framework. And Fire and Rescue Authorities must have regard to that framework in the discharge of their functions. You may not be able to see on the slide there the narrative, so I'll read it out. What it says is that each fire and rescue authority must produce an integrated risk management plan that identifies and assesses all foreseeable fire and rescue related risks that could affect its community, including those of a cross-border, multi-authority and or national nature. The plan must have regard to the Community Risk Register produced by the Local Resilience Forum and any other risk analysis as appropriate. What the framework also says, and in truth is the nub of the issue for us to consider tonight, is that the Fire and Rescue Authority must hold the Chief Fire Officer or Chief Executive, which is one and the same, to account for the delivery of fire and rescue services in this instance across Merseyside. That means ultimately I, and I alone, am held to account for fire and rescue cover and it is that which is my primary concern when making uh, recommendations to the Fire and Rescue Authority. To be clear, under the scheme of operational delegation, I do not have the authority to close West Kirby or Upton and to build a new station at Greasby. Only the Fire and Rescue Authority can make that decision. Only the Fire and Rescue Authority can make that decision based on the requirements of the Fire and Rescue Services Act. I'll, take, I'll cover the point that you make later on in the presentation. I need to make that clear now, and please don't take umbrage at this comment. The Fire and Rescue Authority does not have a statutory duty to keep people in Greece be happy. That is in no way meant to be an inflammatory comment. Is it? it is true. It is, it is true. Very you listen to the people. Very, very what I will say is, and what I will explain in detail as I move through the presentation, the mechanism by which the people of Greasby can oppose any building of a fire station in Greasby. I will make that abundantly clear. And what I will also do, and as I've made clear on every presentation that I've delivered, I will faithfully represent the views of the people of Greasby and West Kirby and Upton to the Fire and Rescue Authority. But ultimately it is they that make the decision, not me. The reason that they are not here is because it is my professional recommendation to them that we are consulting on now. It would be predetermination for them to stand here to argue the case for or otherwise a merger. They need to consider my recommendations in an operational context along with the views of the people in the communities affected. I need to make that point clear to everyone now. Apologies for dwelling on that point. Apologies if I've insulted anyone's intelligence. But it is important to make that clear to everybody. Move the slide on, please, Mickey. Let me say from the outset, there is no prospect that I would recommend the closure of any fire station to the Fire and Rescue Authority if there were any other alternative. The financial challenges that Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority has faced did not start in 2010. They started way back in 2004. 
And there are some legacy reasons for that, which I will attempt to explain on the last four point of this slide. But if I deal with the comprehensive spending review for 2010, so it is that which covers this existing parliament that we are in now, so 2011-12 through 14-15, the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority grant, and that is the money it receives directly from government, has been reduced by 35%. Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority relies on that grant for 70% of its income. The authority can only raise, therefore, 30% of its overall income from preset. That is what we all pay on, in addition to the, the council tax. So you see you have for those of you who all live in Wirral, Wirral Council take the majority of the, the money from the council tax, then the police crime commissioner, then the fire and rescue authority. Over the course of the year uh, with this parliament, the government has limited council tax increases to 2%. What that means is that the authority has no prospect of offsetting in any great, uh, in any great measure the extent of the direct reductions to its grant. That issue was further compounded by the fact that Merseyside has a very low tax base, the lowest in the country. And what that means is the majority of properties on Merseyside fall within band A. That means we have the lowest actual cash terms yield from council tax. The grant cuts in year for 2015-16, so take the fact as of the 1st of April next year, required the authority to make an additional £6.3 million of savings beyond the £20 million of savings the authority has had to make up to this point within this spending review. That is on top of significant reductions since 2004. All of the mainstream political parties are committed to eradicating the structural deficit. That means in the next parliament, whoever is in power, and assuming that the big spending departments such as health and education continue to be protected in the way that they have been, local government, of which Fire and Rescue are part of, will bear the brunt of further efficiency savings. The best case predictions that we've modelled thus far based on information in the public domain assumes that the savings challenge will rise to just over 9 million in 16-17 and potentially up to 20 million by 2020. That is on top of the savings we've had to make up to this point. In the interest of balance, the point I have to make is that Merseyside is still, even after these efficiency savings, the third most expensive authority by grant per head of population and the fifth on overall spend that includes the council tax yield as well there are legacy reasons for that which date back to the 1950s the fire services act sorry the fire service act 1947 was enacted immediately after the second world war and in the early 1950s the riverdale commission undertook a piece of work to determine national standards of fire cover these were, these were repealed in 2004. Those standards of fire cover targeted ostensibly heavy industrial risk. There were four levels of risk categorization. A risk, heavy industry, things like docks. Two pumps in five minutes, one pump in eight minutes. Commercial and medium to light industry, B risk. One pump in five minutes, one pump in eight. Suburban dwellings, one pump in eight to ten minutes. Rural, one pump in twenty. Back in the 50s, the majority of Merseyside was A-risk, the reasons which we will all recall. Back then, Liverpool was the second city. It was 15 miles of operational docks that stretched from Seaforth in the north to Garston at the south of Liverpool, and that was broadly replicated over here on the Will in Birkenhead and Wallasey. That, of course, is now all gone, along with the heavy industry that was once there back in the 50s. Population of Merseyside has also decreased significantly over that time. It was 1.7 million in the 1950s. 
it is now 1.38 million. Population of Liverpool was 853,000, it's now just under half a million. In 2004, when the funding moved to per capita based, i.e. per head of population, we were by some margin the most expensive fine rescue authority in the country. And unfortunately at that point, the chickens well and truly <coughs> came home to roost. In all my time as Chief Fire Officer, I have never presided over a budget that's required me to do anything other than make significant cuts to the Fire and Rescue Authority. That is a fact. Unfortunately, we are at the point now, as I will explain further on in the presentation, where we have nothing left to go at other than fire stations and unfortunately fire engines. Which brings us to this point where we're at now. Vicky, can you move the slide on, please? In terms then of the savings in year 15 16, we are assuming, the authority is assuming, that we will be able to deliver just under £3 million from what we term support services. That, in truth, is not an accurate reflection of what we mean by support services. What we've done is very simply differentiate from expenditure that is not directly on fire stations. We're called everything else support services. This includes our community safety advocacy teams and our protection officers and fire safety enforcement. All of that is frontline. It just isn't fire engines. They need to make that point. We will have to lose more than 40 of our non-uniform staff over the in year 15-16 on top of the 90 uniform staff that we had to take out over the last four years. We are assuming pay restraint to continue for a further two years beyond the, the four, sorry, five years now that the pay restraint has been in, in operation. There is very little prospect we will avoid compulsory redundancies. If I'm honest with you, we haven't done up to this point. What we have done is given people what I would term the Sicilian choice. They either leave on enhanced terms or we make them compulsory redundant. An appalling thing to have to do, but the reality nonetheless. The point to make is that this will and continues to have a significant impact on our organisational organizational capacity, not least to try to deliver all of the, uh, the savings measures that we will have to deliver, some of which I will speak to as I move through the presentation. We'll move on, please, Vicky. Accepting, if we can say, just under three million from uh, support services, so for non-fire station related savings, stands to reason, therefore, that the balance, 3.4 million, has to come from operational response. £3.4 million pounds is broadly 100 firefighters and senior manager posts. That will be achieved through retirement. Right? We're not going to lose all of those posts on the 1st of April 2015. The authority will use reserves to smooth out those uh, post reductions through natural retirement. That is the only way we can avoid compulsory redundancies. In the very simplest of terms, the number of whole-time firefighters we employ, uh, employ directly determines the number of fire engines we can staff, and it is that which ultimately determines the number of fire stations from which we can operate. The savings that we're going to need to deliver in 15-16 will mean that we have no other choice but to reduce our stations down from 26 to 22. We will seek to maintain, however, 28 fire appliances. What we will not be able to do is maintain 28 whole time pumps. What we intend to do is to crew 24 of those appliances whole time, that is with firefighters who are there 24 hours a day on station, ostensibly through a four watch system, on two 12 hour days, two 12 hour nights, and four days off. In order to maintain the number of appliances at 28, what our intention is, is to crew the remaining four appliances on what we term whole time retained. And I will explain what that is in more detail on the, uh, the next slide. If we are unable to secure sufficient numbers of our existing staff, 
to undertake retained cover and what that is very simply is if you accept our staff do two days two nights and have four days off on the middle two days off what we will be asking them to do is for the 10 percent retaining fee provide availability over those two days to respond in on a half hour recall if our appliance numbers falls below a predetermined level i'll explain why that's our intention to do that as i say as we move through the presentation what we may need to do if we cannot secure the appropriate numbers is to recruit directly onto that system i will explain also the reasons why that would be my last resort as i move through the presentation you move on please becky Earlier in the year, the authority undertook a consultation exercise over our integrated risk management plan, as we are required to do. And within that consultation, as clearly we had a very good idea as to the extent of the financial challenge we would face in 15, 16 and beyond, I, as the Chief Fire Officer, advanced the four realistic options which are available to the authority in order to make the structural changes required to meet the reduction in the budget and they are outright station closures right? that is something that we are pursuing in liverpool station mergers and to be clear station mergers is station closures i'm not in any way trying to address that up as being anything other than what it is what that involves is the closure of two stations to build a new station at an optimal distance in between the two stations being marked for closure. Days only crewing is another option that we could pursue. It would not help us clearly at a night time in terms of operational response, but there would be some logic to pursue that option given the fact that it would allow us to facilitate training and community intervention work during the daytime which is something we do a great deal of now the only other realistic alternative would be the use of community retained firefighters and if you just indulge me i'll explain to you now why that is not an option that i would recommend to the fire and rescue authority and if i'm honest this is an option that pretty much every other Fire and Rescue Authority in England recognises is far from the panacea that some suggest it is. We have not had community retained firefighters since 1992, in the true sense. Rainford over in St Helens had a community retained station. The nearest community retained station to here is Frodgham and Cheshire, and that's been long established. What community retained is, is members of the public who must live within five minutes of the fire station who give up, broadly speaking, 120 hours a week to be on cover for which they are paid a 10% retaining fee. So £2,800 a year to remain within five minutes of the fire station. Assuming that we're able to find individuals who were prepared to do that, and let's take West Kirby now as being the, the, the case in point. And it may be that I could. It may be that I could do that. I would need to train them from scratch. It takes 40 weeks to train a whole time firefighter. It takes about two years for them to demonstrate competence. Assuming that I could train a crew of individuals.